Um, I'm actually going to take all of the neuroscience out of this talk except for the very last slide. And if any of you are interested in at least how I think any of what I'm going to talk about applies to neuroscience, I'd be happy to talk to you about it later. Uh, we've heard a lot about quantum theory at this uh, meeting. And what I would like to do is very focused. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, basic consequences of quantum theory as it is, without additional extensions, uh, what it tells us about observation. So let's see if I can work this. Yes. So why am I talking about observation and not, say, consciousness or awareness? Uh, observation is a term that's used very often in physics. And it's kind of a stripped down notion but it does imply certain very particular things. So an observation has to be recorded somehow, and it has to be reportable. And typically it doesn't matter, or it's considered not to matter, what does the recording and what does the reporting. So it can be a person, it can be a computer, it can be a hunk of lucite plastic that a cosmic ray passes through and leaves a track that you can see with a microscope. So the track is a recording, uh, but this case points out something. The reporting by the lucite to us, for example, or to some third party, requires a physical interaction. And in exactly the same way, if someone publishes a paper in Physical Review that, that reports some results, then I've got to physically interact with that object, the copy of Physical Review, in order to get the information. So reporting requires physical interaction, and that's going to be important. Uh, now, observation requires awareness, but it requires awareness in the usual physics sense only in a very, very stripped-down way. It requires differential responsiveness. So you know, if I record my notes on this piece of paper, the paper has to differentially respond to the ink. Some parts of the paper attach themselves to the ink, and other parts don't. So that's differential responsiveness. It's a very simple concept. Uh, but I think that observation provides a model for other sorts of things, such as imagination, a very, a very stripped down and simple model. So it is a useful concept to talk about. And, and it, man, it maintains some consistency with the use of uh, this term in physics. So why quantum theory? We've had lots of motivations for talking about quantum theory. And my motivation is also fairly simple. If we want to understand observation, we have to understand what's out there. So if we think of observation as some sort of interaction between us and the world, we're not going to be able to say anything at all about observation unless we can say something about the world. So talking about the world means considering physics, and that means considering quantum theory. So that's why we're talking about quantum theory just because we want to understand what's going on in the world. So the question is, what is to be observed? And as you all know, there's a very traditional answer. The answer is the classical world. And the classical world can be characterized as bounded objects that move through space and persist through time. So I'm a bounded object, and here I am moving through space, and if you close your eyes and then open them again, I'm still here. You may be unhappy about that, but I persist through time. That's the classical world. Stuff moving, and you can keep track of it. And quantum theory tells us the world's not like that. And it's been telling us for over 80 years now that the world's not like that. And I think it's time we listen to it and ask, so what's quantum physics actually telling us the world is like? And how can we build a theory of observation that's actually fully consistent with what quantum theory is telling us the world is like? So I don't claim to be able to build that theory, uh, but I'd like to sort of point in the direction of what that theory might look like. And I think even pointing in the direction of what that theory might look like leaves us in a pretty interesting place. And if we believe quantum theory, which is a big if, and it's an empirical theory, maybe false, uh, 
And the history of science, in fact, indicates that it almost certainly is false, because all the theories we've ever had in the past have turned out to be false. Uh, so I'm perfectly willing to believe that quantum theory might be false. But if we believe it, then what it tells us about what observation is like, in a sense, defines a starting point for thinking about other things. So if we want to try to develop a theory of consciousness that has to do with how we observe the world, we need to start with what quantum theory tells us the world is like, not start with something else. <laughs> okay. So what does quantum theory tell us the world is like? You've seen versions of this slide before, but I want to spend a little bit of time on it. Um, this is the, the canonical double slit experiment, and this experiment was done with water waves probably 2,000 years ago, whenever someone bothered to build a breakwater that had two openings in it. And it was done with light by Young in the early 1800s. And that sort of established the wave concept of light against Newton's uh, particle concept of light. And then in the early 1900s, uh, there were light sources that were turned down far enough that you could get extremely low intensity. So they were starting to understand photons then, and you could at least approach, approach the idea of one photon at a time going through slits. And by the later 1900s, you could actually achieve one photon at a time going through the slits. Early 60s, one electron at a time going through the slits. And this is, this is interesting. Quantum theory was developed in the 1920s. It wasn't until the 60s that anyone managed to do the key experiment of quantum theory with anything other than photons. So the whole thing was an amazing theoretical tissue because the experimental basis really wasn't there in an important sense until the 60s. So since the 60s, we've gotten one neutron, one atom, you know, one on and on and on up to the early 2000s. Uh, Zelliger's lab managed to get one buckyball at a time. So that's a carbon-60 nanosphere, pretty big thing, you know, the size of a typical protein. Uh, through this double slit apparatus. And what you always see, no matter what you shoot through the double slit apparatus one at a time, is the same thing. You see an interference pattern. And as has been pointed out, if you close one of these slits, then you just get a stripe, right? That's the classical particle result. Um, and if you open the slits, you get this interference pattern, which tells you um, that something is interfering with itself one at a time, in space. So say this is an electron. The electron uh, travels out of this ion source. It follows multiple trajectories. You know, Feynman has a wonderful picture of it flying all over the universe, coming back and landing on the slits. And all of those possible trajectories interfere, and so you get this interference pattern. It's perfectly equally well to think about this as interfering in time. So one particle goes through here and it lands someplace on the screen, and the next particle goes through, but its trajectory interferes with the trajectory of the first particle in time, you get the same interference pattern. And you can do this experiment in the delayed choice form uh, proposed by Wheeler a couple of decades ago, and the results were just presented in science, actually in two back-to-back -back papers a few months ago, done in two totally different ways. So they put this double slit in a superposition of, of one slit and two, and they don't resolve that superposition until one well after the time it takes the particle to get from here to here, and you get an interference pattern whenever the uh, double slit is resolved to have been open, even though that's done after the particle's already landed on the screen. So uh, you can call that backwards causality, you can call it interference uh, between advanced and retarded waves, you can call it anything you want, but that's what happens. This is phenomenology in quantum theory. So there's a basic idea that comes out of this, and you can state that basic idea in one of two ways. I mean, one way is to say the state of any physical system is a linear superposition of all of its possible states. So you can write the wave function, uh, the current state psi, as a sum of some representation of all of its possible states. That's what this bracket x is. And there's a coefficient there, and that coefficient is a complex number. It's the complexity of that number that generates the interference pattern in this representation. So you can say exactly this by writing down Schrodinger's equation and saying physical dynamics are always unitary. And uh, unitary dynamics is such that if you start 
a quantum state, say, psi, out in any particular state. Suppose you prepare the system in a way that puts it in exactly one state, not a superposition. You turn the crank of unitary dynamics and it spreads out all over the universe. So unitary dynamics creates and preserves superpositions. And if you want to be really precise, you say physical dynamics are unitary in isolated systems. And you can try to isolate a system in the lab by putting it at low temperature and high vacuum and all this stuff. But as Everett pointed out back in, this, in the 50s, uh, the really isolated system we know is the universe as a whole. And it's isolated by definition. And that's the concept of the universe we've got. The universe is what there is. Uh, so what Everett pointed out is that uh, this equation applies to the universe. So unitary dynamics is happening everywhere, all the time. Okay, so this obviously creates a problem, and the problem is called the measurement problem. And this problem has bothered physicists since the Solvay Conference back in 1928, and maybe before, and there are countless books and articles that are published about this problem. And the problem is very simple. We don't see any superpositions lying around, at least not macroscopically. So I'm here. I'm not some you know, superposition of here and over there, or here and back in the hotel, or something like that. And I at least seem to be alive. I'm not some superposition of alive and dead, like Schrodinger's cat. Um, so the question is, the measurement problem is, why do we see this? And you can think of Schrodinger's cat, which is probably everyone's favorite example that's, that's put in a state of being alive and dead by being coupled to a radioactive decay that has and has not occurred because no one's looked at it. Um, and what Schrodinger's cat is standing for in this very well-known example is just any measurement apparatus, anything whatsoever that records and then reports an observation. Schrodinger's cat's just our detector. And so you can think of the measurement problem as this problem. How does any detector ever record just one outcome? How do we ever get one outcome, one experience uh, from the world? That's the measurement problem. And that's probably, it's one of two central problems in quantum mechanics. And the other central problem in quantum mechanics is space-time. Uh, how in the world does quantum mechanics link up with space-time? So I don't want to talk about that very much. I'm just going to mention it later. So I'm going to focus on the measurement problem. And as you know, probably there are four standard answers to the measurement problem. And there are a bunch of non-standard answers, but the non-standard ones are actually pretty close to the standard ones. And I want to spend some time on this because they all often generate confusion. Uh, one standard answer, very standard, is that quantum theory is not descriptive. So Christopher Fuchs, for example, says quantum theory is prescriptive. He says it's like the Ten Commandments. Quantum theory tells you how you ought to behave. It doesn't tell you what the world is like. And uh, it's possible, actually, there are lots of passages in both Bohr and Heisenberg that indicate that they actually considered quantum mechanics in this, this way, that quantum mechanics was not descriptive, that it was an epistemic theory about our beliefs and how we ought to reason. Uh, about the world, as opposed to a theory about how the world is. Uh, so one can be, one can take this sort of epistemic approach to quantum theory, say quantum theory is not a descriptive theory, so it's not true or false. It's useful or maybe not useful, but it's not true or false. Uh, so another option is that quantum theory is wrong. And I want to dwell on this a bit because all approaches that postulate a real physical collapse are approaches that say quantum theory is wrong. So, for example, if Penrose is right or Stapp is right about quantum theory, then quantum theory is wrong. Uh, and often people sort of say, no, 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 it's not wrong, it's just incomplete. But uh, it's not incomplete in these cases, it's just wrong. Because quantum theory is supposed to apply to the universe. 
the dynamics of the universe, quantum theory says, are unitary, period. It doesn't say some of the dynamics. It doesn't say sometimes they're unitary. It doesn't say it's unitary sort of in here and not everywhere else. It says it's unitary, full stop. So if you say the dynamics aren't unitary, if there's physical collapse, then quantum theory is wrong. Um, now, how to think about this? Uh, I think if, if you want to, to postulate physical collapse, and so say, say quantum theory is wrong, um, you need to think about where exactly does quantum theory apply? Uh, when exactly is evolution unitary? So if you say unitary evolution only occurs under some conditions, you know, maybe in high vacuum, or only in some places, or only in some times, then uh, a theory is owed about what defines those places or those times, and what separates the part of space where evolution is unitary from the parts of space where evolution is not unitary, etc. And if you push on this position that uh, quantum theory is, is only happening some places, then you tend to get a migration up to this position or down to this position, which I'm going to talk about next. The third option, uh, which has been referred to as the mul multiple worlds interpretation, is the notion that quantum theory is right, but what we observe are only particular sort of branches or histories of the universe. And this is associated with people like Dieter Zay and David Deutsch and Max Tegmark. And they tend to use a graphic to explain this. It looks like sort of a film strip that divides. There's a movie going on, and then it divides, and the movie turns out a little bit differently in the two branches. And I'm going to try to convince you that that picture can't possibly work, that that picture misconstrues quantum theory. So a fourth approach, which is mainly the approach of Zurich uh, and his colleagues, uh, is the approach that says, look, system environment interactions in quantum theory sort of create states that look classical, even though they're not. Quantum theory is right, but there are certain kinds of interactions that create quasi-classicality, and that's what we see as classical states. So um, these are all sort of options that we can think about. And what I want to assume for this talk, since this talks about what quantum theory applies for observation, is that quantum theory is both descriptive, so it's actually about reality, and it's true. So this is an assumption. I want to make it very clear that this is an assumption, uh, that quantum theory is descriptive and true, that we're just going to explore the consequences of for observation. But I will point out that any time you do a physics experiment, it tells you that quantum theory is true. And in fact, they tell us that quantum theory is true to accuracies of like one part in 10 to the 10th. So the predictive accuracy of, of quantum theory is really phenomenally good. And each time a new technology allows us to do something that used to be really weird, like run the delayed choice experiment for real, it tells us that quantum theory is right. So something's going on uh, that looks a whole lot like quantum theory. Uh, so it gives us at least some justification to think that quantum theory is true. And this is a nice paper that just uh, review some of these experiments. It's a little bit old. But the challenge of quantum theory is true is to explain this emergence of, of uh, classicality in purely quantum theoretic terms, no additions. So the current answer to that is decoherence. And you've heard decoherence mentioned. Uh, it was invented in the early 70s and really started to blossom in the 90s. And it's what, in a sense, enabled the whole quantum information and quantum computing revolution. It's reached the status of having major textbooks written about it. So it's a perfectly standard theory. And the basic idea is simple. The basic idea of decoherence is uh, you put a system in an environment. All systems are embedded in environments. There's no really any such thing except the universe as a whole as an isolated system, even in a vacuum box in a laboratory. An electron is interacting with stuff. Right? Cosmic rays, for example, will zip right through almost any vacuum box we create unless we stick it deep in a mine in Japan or something like that. And even then, neutrinos zip right through. 
So you can't really isolate a quantum system. And things in the environment, say photons, for example, are always banging into the system that, that's sitting there. So they're all photons hitting me. They're dust particles hitting me. There are all sorts of phonons hitting me. Um, and decoherence theory says you can, you can calculate the Hamiltonian, the interaction, between this stuff in the environment and the system and turn a mathematical crank. And it will force the state of the system, that's S in a bracket, and the state of the environment, or at least the local environment, that's all anyone ever thinks about, into an eigenstate of this interaction Hamiltonian. And an eigenstate is a very specific state uh, that is the state that that particular interaction gives you a measurement for, effectively. So the Hamiltonian of me right now, if you measure it, is my self-energy, so my body heat and all that other stuff, the amount of energy I contain. So decoherence just says that interactions between a system and environment put the, in, the system in particular eigenstates. And that's the theory of Ein selection. Uh, Zurich gave it that name for environmentally induced super selection. Super selection into a particular state from these sort of interactions. Okay. So decoherence requires decomposition. You notice that the, the blue system has a boundary around it. And that's always true. I mean, all these interpretations assume that systems exist, that you can talk about a quantum system. And at minimum, they assume that you can talk about three quantum systems. They assume that you can take the Hilbert space of the universe, so the space of all the possible states in the universe, and build a tensor product structure, so a mathematical entity that consists of some states that refer to the observer, some states that refer to the system, and some states that refer to the environment. And you've got to do this to, to represent the interaction between the system and the environment. Uh, but the problem is this is a classical assumption. So this is what it looks like, not looked at in physical space, but in Hilbert space. What I've done is draw a line through the set of all possible degrees of freedom in the universe. And I've said there's some degrees of freedom that are part of my system. And there's some degrees of freedom that are part of the environment. And never the twain shall meet. Right? And this is a classical boundary. I haven't said this degree of freedom is partly in the system and partly in the environment. I haven't said this is a superposition, a quantum state relating the system to the environment. I've said it's in the system, no kidding. Well, that's a classical fact. That's a classical assumption. So the situation with decoherence calculations is really making a fudge here. I've specified a classical boundary in Hilbert space. I turned the crank, right, the mathematical crank, and I generated a bunch of quasi-classical pointer states, so specific eigenstates. And this is a perfectly good mathematical explanation of why this system is in these pointer states. But it's not an explanation of classicality, because I assumed classicality up front, right? I drew a classical boundary. So it's absolutely no surprise that if I put classical information in, I'm going to get classical information out. So decoherence as an explanation of classicality is logically circular. It doesn't tell you anything. And it moreover works for any system you please. So if I write down the Hamiltonian of the universe, I can break that up into a sum of terms that talk about the interaction between every pair of things there are at some level of description that I have to keep fixed so I don't overcount. Um, and then I can rearrange that sum any way I want. I can draw parentheses any place I want. And I can define a system that's arbitrarily disconnected, for example. I can say the system is me and Stuart in the moon. And we're going to measure the state of that system. So it doesn't have to be spatially contiguous or anything. It can be microscopic. It can be macroscopic. It can be anything you please. And you still get the same Hamiltonian. So you still get exactly the same dynamics. So the other way to put that is, I can write down any tensor product structure for the universe I please, and I'm not going to change the Hamiltonian at all. So the Hamiltonian is absolutely independent of where I draw the boundaries in Hilbert space. So physics is independent of decomposition. I made this really big, because if you remember one thing, remember this. 
Physics is independent of decomposition. It turns out this is even true in classical physics. Okay. So, um, what does this mean? It means physics doesn't care about boundaries at all. That means that decoherence can't be a physical process. It's just an informational process, and it has nothing to do with the physics. Nothing. So that says that classicality can't physically emerge from quantum theory. There's no such thing as the emergence of classicality as a physical process. It can be an informational process, but it's not a physical process. Quantum mechanics tells you that by itself. No other assumptions. So it also tells you, I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong button. Goodness. Oof. It also tells you that no bounded systems, no systems with boundaries that I've drawn or that anyone else has drawn can be special in any way. By special, I mean have any influence on the dynamics. So the fact that a system is bounded doesn't make it special. And that's true for any systems. That's true for me. Right? I'm a bounded system, and I'm not special. The dynamics just happens. Okay? Okay. Now, this is obviously even a more serious problem than the measurement problem. Without a physical uh, mechanism for emergence, for example, you can't get classical cosmology to even start. And we heard yesterday that uh, to get classical cosmology off the ground, really get a nice classical space-time out of inflation, you've got to have decoherent boundary conditions. But if decoherence isn't physical, none of that happens. You can't get uh, classical space-time out of inflation. And biochemistry and evolutionary biology never get off the ground. So to do evolutionary biology, you've got to be able to talk about individual organisms that either reproduce or they don't, and they either pass on their genes or they don't. So if you don't have any bounded systems, then all that stops. You, know, you can't talk about uh, the evolution of classical organisms in a world that isn't classical, doesn't support any classicality. And in fact, without this emergence, there aren't any objects at all. Okay. So underlying the measurement problem uh, as a problem about why we see things in particular states, there's a really deep problem, which is why we see things at all. Uh, why we see particular things in particular. So why do I see you? Why do I ever see an experimental apparatus as opposed to just stuff or as opposed to totally different kinds of stuff? And why do I ever see the same thing at different times? So what does this notion of temporal continuity of systems mean? What does it mean to say that uh, I was here yesterday and I'm still here today? Now, we don't even know what that means if there's no such thing as an object. So these look like philosophical questions, but I'll submit to you that these are actually physics questions, and they have to be answered by physics for physics to really uh, make progress. So we really do need a theory that accounts for all of this stuff that's formulated within quantum theory. Okay. So how do we do this? Uh, it's my hypothesis, of course, that you can't do it in classical theory, uh, but that you can do it in quantum theory. And the answer is entanglement. And the catch, there's always a catch. The catch here is that the answer is always relative to some third party. Now, how does that work? Um, think, of a, think of the canonical entangled system, right? We've got a spatially separated quantum state, one quantum state that's spread out in space. And we've got two observers, Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob make their measurements. And we can ask, what's the conditional probability that if Alice gets up, say they're measuring spin, Bob is going to get down? Well, if these two states are entangled, that conditional probability is significant. It's better than a half. And that's what violates Bell's inequality. Uh, and if this system is monogamously entangled, so-called, if it's perfectly entangled, then that probability is 1. If Alice gets up, Bob will, with probability 1, get down. So. If you have monogamous entanglement, you have perfect classical correlation. So this is a model for classical information. In fact, it's the only model for, quantum, for classical information in quantum theory. 
the only way to get classical information, classical correlation in quantum theory, is with entanglement. And the only way to get perfect classical correlation in quantum theory is with monogamous entanglement. And this is sort of the new heart of quantum mechanics. I quoted Feynman earlier that the double slit was held up as the, the central concept, and now it's entanglement. So there's a problem with this, clearly, which is it's relative to how you look at the situation. If you look at one event that creates some spatially extended quantum state, you can describe that event in any number of Alice and Bob pairs who are making measurements in different ways using different basis vectors in different places and all of that. So you always have this problem of relativity when you're describing an entangled state. And the, the key reference here is this work of Zanardi and his group. I've just put one paper there. But they've proven very nicely that you can describe a Hilbert space uh, so that any pair of degrees of freedom you like are tangled. You just have to describe it right. So if a third party specifies the description, specifies the decomposition effectively or the basis effectively, uh, you can make anything entangled you want to. Uh, so, sorry. Classical correlation is really only definable with respect to this, this third party. Now, that means that this branching structure that you see in typical presentations of the multiple world interpretation doesn't make any sense uh, because it's observer independent. It says this is, these are the objectively real branches. Well, that's nonsense. There aren't any objectively real branches. There aren't any objectively real histories of the universe. Uh, so, you know, if you buy Tegmark's association of uh, possible universes described within quantum theory with, with the possible universes that result from uh, inflation, it just falls apart. So I'm going to have to go fast. Uh, this is the minimal unit of observation. And you can say with respect to the system, Alice and Bob are entangled. With respect to Bob, Alice and the system are entangled. So this is how classical information flows. But of course, this picture is really misleading. I mean, this thing is actually like that wave in the universal Hamiltonian. It's just a transient bit of structure in what's happening, right? What's happening is the Hamiltonian or the universe just doing its thing. So now let's talk about time. How do I know that I'm entangled with the same thing at different times? How do I know that you know, my apparatus today is the same as my apparatus yesterday? So how can I repeat an experiment? And the answer is I don't. I never know that. I have no idea what degrees of freedom out of the entire universe are causing my experience right now. No idea. I have no idea what degrees of freedom out of the entire universe caused any past experience. I can't find out. I can't do the experiment. So you never know that something's the same now as it was then. And interestingly, all the observable consequences of the standard uh, no-go theorems in quantum theory, like Bell's theorem, follow from this fact. And, in fact, uh, Edward Moore, back in the 50s, gave a very nice proof of this in classical systems theory. And you can just take his proof and translate it into quantum theoretical terms and get the no-go theorems. OK, so take home one. There's no objective classical world, and there are no objective quantum systems either. Uh, Classical information is never objective. It's always intersubjective. Always requires multiple parties to even be defined. So you've got to add semantics to physics to get anything. OK. Um, and this, of course, is an old point. Uh, Charles Whitehead's made it at this meeting. Uh, James Gibson made it. Uh, Wittgenstein made it. William James has made it. Lots of people have made this point. Uh, so this has to be abandoned. I mean, we have to get rid of dual thinking, thinking about duality, to do physics. Uh, this has to go. And I want to quote Jack Ellis here. He said, one system, yes. One system, no duality. Forget about that. Or it's impossible to actually talk about observation in quantum theory. So we need to replace it with something that looks like this. Uh, if we think of, of sorry, physical reality as what's happening in Hilbert space, as the Hamiltonian just doing its thing, then all this other stuff is semantics. All this other stuff is interpretation. And it's intersubjective. It's not objective. They're arbitrarily num 
arbitrary number of different interpretations of what's going on that are equally possible, and we're just involved in one of them. Right? This is, we can think of this as, as what the universe means. Uh, but there are lots of things the universe means that have nothing whatsoever to do with us, that we don't even enter into. So uh, observers, systems, decisions, theories, all that stuff's up here. Uh, it's semantics, it's not physics. Now, I want to point out that this is a really familiar picture. And actually, Eleanor Lorick pointed this out in her talk a couple of days ago. Uh, if we think of the relationship between a user interface and what's going on in a box, in a physical computer, then we get exactly the same sort of picture. I mean, what's going on is a bunch of stuff in the world. The universe is doing something or other. But what we see is this. We see a user interface. And if we want to accomplish stuff, you know, I want to put this talk together, I've got to work up here. But if we want to understand anything, we've got to work down here, or at least at some intermediate level. And I want to emphasize that this is, you know, this is all a computer. If you look in your computer deeply enough, you'll see that. That's the inside of the CPU of some computer or other. But is this a classical system? No. It's semantics. It's a description we've given to the world. So if we look at the brain, a bunch of stuff is happening. We say, that's a microtubule. Well, that's a description. That's already semantics. To say, that's a molecule, even. And to differentiate that from all the stuff that's going on around it. So please don't think of classical and quantum computers as being different things. They're just different descriptions of what the universe is doing, or even what a kind of localized part of the universe is doing. So they're a different description of some fluffy wave in that picture of water I showed you earlier. That's the best picture I can think of to, to, to try to communicate what physics is about. OK. So real quick, take on theory two. Uh, our perceived reality is just what the universe is doing. You can think of that as quantum computation as you want to, but it's just dynamics. And what we call observation, here's the theory part, is a transient semantic relationship that's implemented by what the universe is doing. So if you want a physical theory of observation based on quantum theory, you're going to get something like this. So this, I would submit, is the starting point for a theory of consciousness. It's really not where it's going. It's where it's got to start if quantum theory is true. And quantum theory is the best theory we've got. So real quick, what does this mean for neuroscience? I think it just forces a new perspective. It, it makes Sorry us think of... Sorry to interrupt of, you, sir, but we are running out of time. Okay, I'll finish. It makes us think of things like object identity as a deep mystery to be addressed. It makes us realize the brain's not a classical computer because there aren't any. It's just some semantics. And it tells us that object awareness is intrinsically transpersonal because classical information is intrinsically class transpersonal. So, thank you. I think we have time for just one question, probably. Thank you so much. Br brilliant talk. Um, I wanted to get your um, take on some of the efforts um, to move away from unitarity, namely the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Do you ho hold much hope for that path? Um, well, I would say I, I actually. I don't see much reason for it at this point from an empirical point of view, since the Schrodinger equation seems to do just fine. Uh, you can look at something like de Broglie bone theory where you add terms, or you can look at uh, the sort of physical collapse theories that you have. Uh, but so far, we have no idea how to do an experiment to actually test and see if there are any non-unitary terms in the Schrodinger equation. So if there are, then quantum theory is wrong. And you can take all this stuff and throw it out the window. 